All right, so just an overview for our piece. So we're, we'll be going over hurricane hazards, the um, how to be prepared, you know, some preparedness tips, evacuation procedures, what a safe haven is, and then the process for returning after a hurricane. All right, so one of the hurricane hazards is storm surge. That is labeled as the number one killer. Uh, so storm surge is actually an abnormal rise of water generated by a storm's winds and they can reach up to heights of well over 20 feet. They can span hundreds of miles of coastline as well as travel several miles inland. The storm tide is the water level rise due to a, uh, during a storm due to the combination of storm surge and the astronomical tide. And the destructive power of storm surge and the large battering waves can result in building damage and loss of life. So one of the biggest things when it comes to this slide is if you look at this link right here at the bottom, that's going to be really important. Uh, if you could just type in Know Your Zone on Google, it should be like the first website that comes up. Uh, but that'll give you really important information as far as what your zone is, as far as like where you live. So if you haven't bought a house or if, you, if you've been house hunting and looking at stuff, uh, it's important to know what zone that you're in or what zone that you are uh, could possibly be in. Because uh, that'll come into effect when it comes to evacuating for storm surges and stuff like that. So keep that in mind. Hello everyone, Noel Garcia, Installation Emergency Management. So another major hazard for, from a hurricane, it will be the rainfall and flooding that it causes. So this poses significant risks to communities far from the coast. As hurricanes move inland, they may lose their characteristic wind strength, but retain the capacity to produce heavy rain over a large area, which would then lead to inland flooding. This becomes more crucial when planning alternate evac locations which we will discuss momentarily. So of course, uh, if a storm is moving slower and if it's larger, this can produce more rainfall, which could be more of a risk for flooding as well. Especially those that live close to a large body of water, such as a river, lake, this will increase the risk of flooding. <clears throat> so before hurricane season, it's important to be prepared as, as you can possibly be. Uh, have a plan of where you will stay during the hurricane and how you'll get there safely. Uh, identify any essential items uh, that you will need during the storm and after it passes. Stay informed on the progress and the development of the storm. And then lastly, communicate your plan with coworkers, friends, and then families, just so that they know uh, where your whereabouts are. So it is important to be prepared before hurricane season starts. Okay. So family emergency planning is crucial to ensure your family's safety. Coordinate primary and alternate meeting locations as well as safe evac routes. Keep track of your emergency contacts, family phone numbers, and medical needs that your family may have. Utilities should be turned off during your evacuation in order to, more, uh, to avoid more power disruptions after electricity is restored. The majority of secondary power outages are brought on by large loads when the energy system is first coming online. So the different counties produce different uh, disaster preparedness guides. So it's important to kind of research what your county has specifically, as it would be more tailored to where you live, live and the hazards that your um, community poses. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, this is a link that will help you find where your county's disaster preparedness guide is. All right, so for the next part uh, is building a kit. So it's pretty self-explanatory and I'm sure it's very easily just being prepared for any situation, right? If you were to go for like an outing, you prepare for that, right? Uh, for hurricanes and for this type of thing, it's important to get ready and be prepared as soon as you possibly can. All right, if you wait for the last minute, everyone's going to have that same idea. And so now you're having to deal and compete with all those other people as well. So when you're planning for supplies, you want to try and plan for like about 14 days, two weeks. Uh, and all the listed items that you see here are things that you want to, you know, obviously prepare for and plan. But all these items that are listed are not, it's not all encompassing. So you might have to get more items, you know, depending on what your family needs. All right, so it's important to obviously have some type of, uh, some documents, some cash, right, some hygiene items, pet needs, food items some water, and then when it comes to the first aid kit, right, prescription medication, those are obviously really highly important, and that depends on what your family specifically needs. So like I said earlier, it's important to stay prepared before the hurricane season starts, okay? 
One of the ways to stay prepared is to sign up for local um, alerts. You can download Alert Tampa or Hillsborough County Flo uh, Florida Alert System. Um, it's an app on your phone. Um, military and GS civilians may use um, something called AHOC or AFPAS for accountability and to receive notifications if there's anything on base. <clears throat> All right, so for a safe haven, what is a safe haven? So in the event of evacuation, it is necessary, necessary to predetermine a safe location. All right, so it's a location that's outside of the Tampa Bay region, and it's limited to the CONUS uh, distance set by the wing commander. All right, on average, it's about 800 miles, but that's going to, like I said, differentiate depending on the wing commander. All right, and then for your location, you need to be able to return back to base within 24 hours of a recall. So as long as it fits the bill for all of those, then you're pretty good. All right, in this last slide, we'll be going over tips and, and to before the storm, during, and after. I won't read through all of them, but some, some major ones before the storm will be uh, just sec securing any equipment that you have outside and, of course, strengthening your home. This will mitigate the damage that a hurricane could, could possess. Um, also, uh, fill, uh, one neat trick is to fill up the sinks, bathtubs with water. This will allow you to um, possess more water. Now, during a storm, if you have not evacuated, just stay up to date on any news and information that comes out. Um, avoid windows, glass doors, or anything that could break. And do not go outside, even when the hurricane storm is passing, as you could be in the middle of the eye, and the, the winds could start again shortly after. Now, if you have evacuated, um, it's important to note that if a mandatory evacuation order is given, Military members may not evacuate until a military order is given. But ev evacuate as soon as possible when ordered and ensure your family knows where you are. After the storm, do not return until authorities uh, clear the area and drive only when necessary. All right. For more information, please contact your unit's emergency preparedness co coordinators also known as EM reps, or contact us at 828-4321. All right, now, uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you everyone. I would like to invite Weather. Good afternoon, I'm Senior Bell, flight chief over at the Weather Shop. So uh, today, of course, it's not working, it's not like that. Oh, sure. no, no, it's fine, I can do that. You sure? Yeah, okay. All right, so, uh, obviously, we're in a very hot spot for hurricanes, so it's not a matter of if, when, the, if they'll happen, but when they'll happen. Uh, right here, you see a couple of pictures of the last big uh, hurricanes that were in the area within the last six years. So, right here, you see the categories that we use to define uh, what we're seeing, and that's based off of certain wind speeds. So what we do is, is we'll call it a depression once we start getting to under 39 knots, but the signatures are there for a potential hurricane to form. Uh, once it becomes a storm, then we give it a name. And once those names uh, are given, once the storm is within 500 nautical miles of base, we start producing tropical weather alerts. And those are sent to uh, mission partners and wing leadership, and they use those to drive decisions. The main thing that they use to drive those decisions is hurricanes, which is hurricane conditions. And so uh, most importantly for you all, uh, just know that uh, airplanes are definitely more fragile uh, and have different requirements to evacuate. So uh, those would be bugged out first. And then once we've determined that uh, surges or winds are gonna be strong enough, uh, the wing commander may issue an evacuation uh, and that will happen before uh, one Charlie and one Echo, which is basically the storm or some of those storm conditions are on top of us. So from a climatology standpoint, we're looking at September and October as our prime months to see hurricanes and tropical storms here at McDill. And that plays out with the strengths of uh, the hurricanes that we see here. Generally speaking, we see uh, category two but uh, we have seen uh, higher than uh, two here as well. And again, we're looking for September and October to be the prime months that we'll expect to see those uh, conditions. 
So as for the hurricane outlook for this year, we're looking for above average uh, activity for the year with 23 named tropical storms, 11 of which becoming hurricanes and five of those becoming major hurricanes. Major hurricane is uh, category three or higher. Uh, the reason why we're expecting for that to happen is because the uh, water temperatures are higher than average already right now. And we're also tr transitioning from an El Nino to a La Nina, which provides uh, favorable conditions in the atmosphere to uh, help them, uh, hurricanes form and intensify. Uh, to give you some perspective, 2005 and 2020 are two of our busiest uh, seasons on record. And 2005 had four cat category five storms, which is crazy. And obviously you see the names that are up there. And if you're old enough, you remember those. Uh, so last year we had 20 named tropical storms and seven of those became hurricanes, three of which intensified to major hurricanes. Now, as emergency management said, the main uh, threat to loss of life is when you have uh, storm surges as high as giraffes necks. And uh, the other thing is, is when the winds are howling, uh, they can be really strong and become a uh, plangent. So uh, just make sure that you follow any advice that you get from wing leadership. And this is what I discussed and pending any questions, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, up next we have the Med Group. Good afternoon. I am A1C Alyssa Masato. I'm assigned to the sixth medical group, and I'm here to give you your medical hurricane preparedness brief. Stay informed of the latest updates and evacuation orders. If you're evacuated, take the necessary precautions. You can get care during any time of the crisis and get alerts with the link below. If evacuated, displaced, and need a non-emergent care, we have provided two resources. The first one would be to contact the nurse advice line with the number provided, or you can also contact Humana Military with their number provided as well. Humana Military's hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time and Central Time. Consult your physician and medical supply vendors to ensure you are adequately prepared for your hurricane. Identify a safe haven for relocation in the need of evacuation. If you are an expected mother, we have a provided link with resources and steps for preparation. Before a disaster, we would advise you to ensure DEERS and AFPAS is updated with your current unit and home address, plan a safe evacuation route, and identify a safe shelter space. If you're evacuating, items to consider are uniform services identification card, any other health insurance card, driver's license and social security card, your preferred source of funds, prescription containers, important phone numbers, any important medical or military information and documents, shot records, and a first aid kit. Special needs. If you have special needs, talk to your doctors about emergency medical plans. Know the location of more than one facility if you need dialysis or other life-sustaining treatment. Wear medical alert tags or bracelets. Arrange to get disaster warnings and arrange for help getting to a shelter. Prepare to bring the following items with you. Your doctor's contact information, a list of your specific illnesses, allergies, and medicines, including dosages, a list of your medical devices, including type and model number, at least one week supply of medicine, any needed medical devices or equipment, and last but not least, special foods or supplements and food for your service animals. Okay. Thank you. CPTS, friends. Hello everyone, I'm Sergeant Williams from the Finance Office, uh, NCIC for Customer Service. So I'm just going to go over the uh, hurricane evacuation travel entitlements. Yep. Alright, so just going over 
uh, Hercon 5. Uh, so for that one, uh, that's when the the wing is gonna try to be updating their POCs, and usually around this time, this is where the certification rosters are trying to get finalized, and usually the ones that are in charge of those will be the first sergeant or your leadership uh, that's in your units. So there's gonna be pretty much doing a recall, see what your plan is, to see if you're evacuating or if you're staying, and if you're one of those mandatory folks that have to be uh, evacuating, then they'll put your information onto the roster, and then once um, they have all your information on there, then it's signed by your unit commander, because that's be one of the documents that we would need in order to process if you're a hurricane voucher. So as you can see here for the requirements, just need your name, age if you have dependents, uh, and then just identifying every person that's under uh, for your dependents, their names, then the unit commander signature. So here is just an example of this certification roster. So as you can see for this one, uh, this member, the sponsor is actually an HRT member. So they're actually one of the ones that goes off to one of those authorized locations. Usually it's the Raymond uh, James, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers Stadium. Um, but their dependents, as you can see on that second to last column, they did not travel with them. So obviously they went somewhere else. So they would have to do two different vouchers. And this is just a way for us to know. So that way, when we do do the voucher, so that way we'll actually know if you to, that you have to do two vouchers and then uh, at the top right is where your commander would actually sign for the certification roster. Alright, so this is just going over the different Hercons. So for Hercon 4, uh, that's when the Leo will be drafted up. Uh, so at this point, we're trying to get the lines of accounting, get with the budget team for ASP codes. And then customer service will usually send out um, uh, what you're being entitled to over the PA and then they'll be the ones that will disseminate that to the base and so that way you'll know what you're entitled to and then they'll also update it on the uh, MGDIL page and then the dispersion agents and the HRT leads they'll come up with an amount for whenever they go to the uh, HRT location how much money they should bring with them so that way they can pay off any paying agents or pay off anyone that needs funds if their GTC is not working. For her calling three, uh, so that's when Leo be issued and entitlements, you'll know when entitlements will actually start and what date they'll end. And you cannot use your GTC until the entitlement start date. And then here, uh, we would also contact IMSC, uh, this headquarters, so that way we can put the whole base into a mass uh, critical mission critical status. Uh, so pretty much all that means is once your card is actually charged, you will just receive additional time to pay off that card until your voucher is actually paid for. And for Hercon 2, uh, that's when DDO and HRT, they'll finalize a plan so that way they'll actually know exactly the amount, how much they'll have cash on hand. And then for Hercon 1, uh, that's when the Leos actually publish and PA disseminates that information. All right, so then once we get to the recovery stage, so now everyone has already returned back to the base, then that's when we'll give out uh, dates and times when units can actually come in and we'll have a location. So most of the time that'll be in the gym and we'll have a mass briefing in there to help people out fill out their travel vouchers or we'll have you come to our joint conference room and then we'll also have you do vouchers in there as well. But for the voucher requirements, as I was saying earlier, be your certif certification roster. So at this point, it should be signed. And if you don't have that, then we would end up turning you away. And then just make sure you have all your lodging receipts and anything that's over $75. And for the lodging receipts, uh, what we've seen a couple times, what people will try to do, they'll try to use like their points, like there are hotel points to try to get like for free and then also try to claim that. But technically speaking, you didn't really pay for it. So that is unauthorized. And also you would need the duplicate payment 
certification form. Uh, so for that form, is this pretty much saying that you certify that you did not receive any payments like from your insurance, uh, FEMA, or uh, Red Cross, uh, so anything that you would be entitled to for the voucher, so like lodging, for example. So if you call up your insurance, they say, hey, during this hurricane, we can pay for your lodging until the hurricane passes. Well, this form is just letting us know that if you received money or not from any of those entities. And if you did, then you would have to cross that you did. But if we find out that you did, then obviously that'd be fraud and also unauthorized. And then depending on uh, if you are non Air Force, so any other branch, Army, Marines, since they're using our line of accounting, we would also be able to help them out, but they'll need an EFT form. And also for members um, that are claiming for their spouses, so if their spouses uh, traveled without the, uh, the member, then they would also need to fill out an EFT form as well. And then we would also need the uh, 1610, which is the authorization, and then the LEO, which is the evacuation order. And then for folks that are single, uh, unaccompanied, then they would just fill out their voucher in DTS. And then you would just be entitled to for lodging and then per diem and for mileage. Uh, so the mileage will also state how many miles you'd be entitled to with the mileage uh, radiuses. So usually it'll be 350 miles. So I'll be one way and then going back. So if you end up going all the way to Georgia, uh, you would just be limited to a total of 700 miles. Uh, any questions? All right. Appreciate it. So up next we have FSS. Good afternoon, I'm Mr. Harley Smith. I am the uh, installation personal readiness and I'm the overseer of uh, personal accountability for all Air Force people on McDeal. Um, first thing we want to do is uh, we want to prepare for the hurricane season. How we do that in APAS? Well, you should already been directed by your units to update, and as I said, many slides to update APAS and DEERS uh, with a current address for you and your family members. Why is this important? Because at pass, when they build events, they build off of a geographical area of interest. So that area of interest is going to encompass all those addresses and deers and at pass and put it into the event so you can be accounted for. Uh, update if it's not correct. Um, we're supposed to update them yearly anyway. So that's why we do the TMT tasker yearly that everybody goes and verifies and validates their stuff. Ensure you have a log on to app pass. Uh, if, if you're directed to evacuate and you don't, you're not taking your government laptop, if you're on a, a civilian laptop that doesn't have a CAC reader or you're using the apps that they have provided in uh, the, Apple, um, the Apple App Store and on the, um, on the Google Store, uh, make sure that you have a username and password set or you're not gonna be able to get in and log in to app pass to, uh, to account for yourselves. Uh, and like I said, they can be downloaded. Uh, if an app pass event is created uh, for the Tampa area, the number that you have in app pass as your primary number, it should be your cell number because it's going to send you a text that says, hey, we've, we've included you in this event and you need to account for yourselves. Uh, also, the HRT will send out a ad hoc to uh, with those so if you have your information and how an ad hoc correct you'll get that message also for from text uh, no doubt note how to account for you and your family know where to go know how to account in the app pass area uh, and kind of look over it if you haven't logged in you might want to log in before the hurricane season starts and and get familiar with the app and and the, and the uh, information in there if your family uh, require assistance, there's there's a needs assessment that that'll need to be com uh, that need to be completed in that pass, and uh, Mass Sergeant Costner is going to brief us on that. That's going to be our next slide. But stay uh, in your evacuation location until you're told to return by your leadership. All right. Any questions about that pass and accountability? All right, Mass Sergeant Costner. Thank you, sir. 
So in the event of a uh, hurricane, any natural disaster, if the wing commander dictates, we will activate what's called the Emergency Family Assistance Center. Sorry, by the way, I'm Master Sergeant Steve Koster from the 6th Force Support Squadron Military and Family Readiness Center Readiness Section. And uh, my job centers around deployment readiness and um, the, we're one of the lead POCs for the EFAC if it were to be activated. So the EFAC, um, after the storm, if it is activated, ideally we would do it here on base, but we do have a backup location at the Kate Jackson Community Center in Hyde Park. Uh, we've actually added some other things as well. Um, we have the ability to do it hybrid and in a, um, a fully remote as well. Um, if, if either location is inhabitable, we still have staff members that will be standing by 24 seven because we will be in 24 hour ops to assist any family with anything that they may need. And what that's gonna look like is, it's, it's gonna be triggered through AFPAS. So your AFPAS will send you a needs assessment. So in that needs assessment, it is important that you're able to access the system to be able to get in there and answer those questions. Those AFPAS cases will come to us. And um, we have three leads over at the Military and Family Readiness Center that will, they will, um, assign those cases to the various staff members so one of us will be calling you guys to follow up on the the things that you said you may need whether that be transportation or housing or food shelter um, all different type of things we handle a lot of cases uh, more particularly with efmp families and um, we'll have somebody always there to be able to help you guys out with that AFPAS is very important though uh, as mr harlan said it's important to make sure that your location is up to date and all your information is up to date and you, and you know that you can access it before the event of a storm. We also partner with, uh, with the city of Tampa and Hillsborough County for evacuation support and special accommodation shelters. That's gonna be for mainly for the EFMP and, and maybe handicap accessible needs. In addition to that, we, uh, we will have several base agencies that will be there to support. So the EFAC is not just compromise or comprised of military and family readiness staff members. It's uh, LRS, uh, CE, Security Forces has an element. Um, we'll have PA, legal, mental health, public health. We have a lot of different agencies that'll be there to help. The Red Cross will be there um, as well. They have several volunteers that they will assign to us during that time. So really we're, we're here for everybody, for anything that they need. Just make sure that you, if you see those needs assessments, do them in a timely fashion and make sure that you're honest about what your needs are. That way, if you guys do need help, don't suffer in silence and, and let us make sure that we can follow up with you and get, the, get you the help that you need. Um, lastly, we have a piece in the Air Force Aid Society, but not just the Air Force Aid Society, all different branches of service. So the Army Emergency Relief Fund and then the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society as well. All those cases are now centrally handled as of September of 2022, I believe it was when Hurricane Ian hit right after that time is where they the casework went away from the bases and now it's handled at air force aid society so all those applications are done online which is great for you as the member because it doesn't trigger you having to come in to see us or contact us really in any way but something that we do still offer is the application process can be a little bit tedious especially in a, in a time right after a natural disaster um, we will be there to help so we can sit down with you guys or even over the phone remotely, however it works for you, we will sit down and help you through the application process and get you to the finish line to make sure that you get the money that you're asking for. Also, there is a possibility for post-disaster grants. We have seen that uh, Hurricane Ian would be a good example. The Air Force Aid Society was offering grants in the amount of $600, where if people lost power and maybe lost items in the refrigerator and things of that nature. Um, and we can certainly help with that as well. We will put somebody over where, with finance when they're doing travel vouchers. We'll have Red Cross and one of our members there as well to assist you through those Air Force aid applications if it is deemed necessary. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, that's all I can answer. All right, up next we have the Emergency Management Office for Tampa.
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Riley Tuff. I'm with the City of Tampa and our Office of Emergency Management. And we collaborate with Mark and the EM team here to make sure that we help to take precautionary measures to take care of the citizens of the City of Tampa and the base as well, because you are within our city limits. So before I dig into things, I just want to ask one question. Show of hands, how many people were here for this presentation last year? OK. All right. So that, thank you. You all taught me a very important lesson last year because I went up and I gave what I thought was the best improv joke I've done in like my 15 years as a public speaker and it was met with critics or crickets. So you guys are harsh critics and I'm going to just stick with the facts this time around. <laughs> Ooh. So we said a lot of this main stuff that we talk about for emergency management because it's the same thing we say basically year after year after year in regards to hurricane preparedness. So what I can kind of talk about is specifically our program and the things that we offer here for the city of Tampa. So overviewing us, we have our EOC readiness, we do our emergency planning, our trainings, exercises. This is all stuff we do in blue skies when we're not doing disaster preparedness. So this is part of collaborations we have with Mark and our, the team here. We do our exercises. We participated with the uh, Airfest. We had folks in your emergency operations center. And so we build relationships. We build collaborations with the, with the people in our, our area. And we also talk about disaster plans, update things, make sure that we're just on, on the ball. Because if we just make a plan and put it on the shelf and it gets, doesn't get touched on or looked at year after year, it's not a usable plan. Because we don't know who's in there or we don't. We don't know what's necessarily inside of it. So we want to make sure that we're touching base, reaching out to folks like we do right now, talking to you, getting face to face with our team here. It helps to build relationships. And that's kind of the goal of emergency management when we're talking about these blue skies. But if we're going to switch over to gray skies, we have some other things that we're responsible for. Most importantly being our emergency operations center, setting up our facilities where all the main stakeholders within our community or within our jurisdiction have the ability to talk to each other. So we don't if we have fire chief there, police chief, our chief of staff, our mayor, anybody that has a major stake in regards to the response operations has a seat within the EOC to make sure that we're all collaborating and working together on solving the problems. We monitor severe weather events that are going on. We make sit reps situation reports so we update information. We share that with all of our partners. I know we specifically shoot them out to the folks here at McDill. We do sheltering, points of distribution, and emergency notifications. One of the big things that I like you guys to know about in regards to our specific roles during disasters is our ERC, our push crews. So essentially, after a storm comes through, it wrecks things within our community. Buildings get knocked down, trees get uprooted, roads get disrupted, and we can't come out there. We can't help people if we can't reach you. And that's one of the biggest things that we talk about having those kits, having those plans, because we may not be able to get to you within 72 hours to a week. So that's why it's important you, you have those resources on hand so that in the event that we need to do some of these push crews, you guys are taking care of yourselves in the meantime. But what essentially these ERCs are, we need to establish traffic routes. We need to be able to make sure we can travel through the city. So we have stationed throughout the city three locations where we send our public works, our law enforcement, and our firefighters to stage beforehand. And after the storm goes through, they travel these routes doing as much as they can to clear out debris, to open up roadways. So that's one of the services that we really help to provide following the impact of the storm. We also have our hurricane reentry program. So after everybody evacuates, we're leaving the city, we're trying to clear out. Essentially, we're hoping you take those steps because ultimately, even a mandatory evacuation is optional for the general public. We can't force people out of their homes. But for anybody that's coming back in, there's going to be a process that's run by our police department to help make sure people are coming back to the right locations. They're coming back to where they actually live, preventing any disaster tourism that may be going on to see how bad the storm was. It's not required to have a hang tag because there will be a processing that our uh, law enforcement will be doing. But if you do have one of these hang tags, it's essentially our Disney Fast Pass for getting people back into the city. They'll be able to see the hang tag hanging from your uh, rear view mirror and understand that you have checked in with us. You're within our roster, our database, and let you in much quicker than the other folks who have not. And something else that uh, we encourage with our folks in our city is getting involved becoming active with our program. If we know who you are, 
we, we have relations with you, we can better work with you to ensure that our community is safer and stronger and more resilient. So we do what's called our CERT program. And this is a group of regular community citizens, everyday people that have just decided, you know what, I want to learn what it takes to be a responder. And we show, take them through a basic disaster course. They learn about fire suppression, search and rescue, basic medical care, disaster psychology, and a slew of other topics on how to better themselves and be a more valuable asset if something were to happen in their neighborhoods. And so just some pictures up here are some of the volunteers. Uh, that's them putting out the fire with our, our fire training staff. This was at a drill and exercise, these other two pictures, where they, they uh, are processing people that are coming into one of our family reunification centers. And in no case will we ever be putting the general public into a place where they need to be wearing these hazmat suits like that. But we had an offer from one of our local um, hazardous materials teams uh, give us a little drill on the uh, donning and doffing of the gear. So we thought it looked a little bit fun, so we gave them an opportunity to do that. Most importantly, if we can't talk to you, if we can't reach you, we can't share our information with you. So one of the biggest ways that if you want to get notifications, if you want to get information about what's going on, we ask you to sign up for Alert Tampa. This is the Everbridge notification system that we utilize as the city to send out alerts and notifications on major events. And I understand, I've been a Florida resident for over 30 years. I've had a weather radio. I know at 3 o'clock almost every July through September, there's going to be a tone going through your system saying, look out, a storm is coming. We understand that. We understand the fatigue that goes along with that, and eventually you just start to ignore those notifications. And because of that, when we say sign up for Alert Tampa, I can guarantee you we are only sending out notifications that are going to be life or death, very threatening matters, or something major, some sort of, uh, something that we deem to be a relevant thing. It's not going to be just afternoon thunderstorms we're sending warnings about. So please, if you want, are interested in signing up, you can go to tampa.gov slash alert tampa. If you sign up that way, you can actually pick what you want to receive notifications on. Otherwise, the easy way is just tamp, tamp, to text Tampa Ready to 888-777, and then you'll get all of our notifications. In addition to that, we have throughout the city weather stations that are called through this weather STEM system, and they do real-time weather information. So if you're interested in knowing what's going on in your neighborhood, in your community, find the station that's closest to you and check them out uh, through the weather STEM app. So you can download this onto your phone, and I understand everybody and their mother these days are asking you to download their app, sign up for their service, give you your email address so we can send you messaging and information. And so if you have no desire to download the weather STEM app, that's okay too. I don't want to make you have to put anything onto your device that you don't want to have on there. But that is available and a good information source for folks that want to know about the local weather conditions. And follow, follow, finally, we have our social media that we provide as an information source as well. So Alert Tampa, it's on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So if you want to follow us on any of those platforms, we give out almost daily information on things that are going on, best practices, stuff that's going on in our, in our community, ways that you can get plugged in and involved. It's all available through these services. And if, when I say sign up for these services and get information, we don't have a digital media team that handles this stuff. So it's literally me, my boss, and my coworkers that are making the posts. So there is a bit more personal touch than maybe with a lot of other social medias out there because we're the ones that are actually posting it on there. But otherwise, there's some additional resources if you want to get more plugged in or more knowledgeable on these topics. We have information on the special needs registration system that's run through Hillsborough County and the um, Hillsborough County Department of Health. If you have loved ones that need assistance, that may be on some sort of medication or need electricity and they don't have a plan on where to go when you evacuate, please get them signed up with the special needs registration system because we'll have a special place for them. We'll provide transportation services for them to go to that location. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of them. That's some information for kids all up on here. But if you want to dig into get some more information, those are some options that are available too. So otherwise, that's the main things that I wanted to hit on to let you understand what the city of Tampa and our emergency management team do. All right. All right, so typically we'll have Hillsborough County's EM office uh, come up next as the final brief, but they are currently not here. Uh, so that concludes our hurricane preparedness brief for today. So thank you all for coming and y'all have a good day.